very good afternoon to you all. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the next instalment of the Queensland Conservatorium Research Centre's Behind the Music series. For those of you who I haven't met, my name is Bridie Bartleet and I have the great honour of being the director of the Research Centre here. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our featured speaker this afternoon, Dr Louise Denson. Um, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we are gathered here today and holding our series, um, and to pay my respects to Elders past and present, and of course acknowledge that it's NAIDOC week this week, and we're looking forward to celebrating with a special concert tomorrow, so we hope you can join us for that if you're interested. But on to our special speaker today. I think Louise Denson needs no introduction. She's a much respected and much loved member of faculty here at the Con, known as a great performer, also a great scholar, also a great teacher. But interestingly today, she's going to be focusing on her greatness as a composer. And I think it's quite phenomenal that Louise boasts that she has at this point in her life written over 100 jazz, Brazilian and Afro-Cuban tunes, as well as countless arrangements for jazz and Latin ensembles. And it's that particular practice and that story of evolution as a composer that Louise is going to take us behind the scenes for today. So I'm sure you're in for a treat. Would you please join me in welcoming Louise Denson. Thank you, Brody. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm delighted and really very pleased that I've been asked today to talk about my work as a composer. Um, I'd also like to begin by saying thank you not only to Bridie but to the Queensland Conservatorium Research Centre that sponsors this series of seminars which are designed to give a platform for artistic researchers. Uh, some of you in the room may be aware that the Queensland Conservatorium is really a leader in this field in Australia. And um, so it's wonderful that we have an opportunity to talk about our work in this kind of a forum to uh, like-minded people. Um, so today I'm going to hopefully be able to share a few insights with you today about my practice as a composer. Writing music is a process which I find um, very satisfying um, and also in some ways still very mysterious. <laughs> so. I might start with this wonderful quote from uh, a musician scholar, um, Graham Collier, who says, most composers don't really know how composing happens, and after it has happened, remember so little of the creative process that they will ask in be bewilderment, did I write that? Um, this quote goes a long way to describing why I have always been perhaps a little reluctant to talk about my own work in great detail. As many of you will know, part of my role working with masters and doctoral candidates here at the Con is to guide and encourage them to talk about their creative work. So it's a bit ironic that I uh, tend to hide my own light under a bushel. My initial idea for this presentation was to focus on a couple of recent works and to just discuss the musical and extra musical um, features of the work and maybe the ideas that lay behind them. But the more I thought about what I wanted to talk about today, the more I realized that um, there were some bigger issues that I would like to address, bigger than just uh, why I chose certain chords or why the melody goes a certain way in this particular composition. I thought that I might want to talk about things that are behind all of my music rather than any particular arrangement or song or composition. And the answer I think is of course that there are always a combination of extra musical factors and musical factors that um, lie behind any piece of work, not only my work, but the work of any songwriter or composer in the world. The topic of my uh, Doctor, of Arts, Doctor of Musical Arts disser dissertation, which I completed in 2014, was also the evolution of my voice as a composer, and especially as a jazz composer, who is not African American, and in fact, I'm not even American, um, and also I'm female. So, in other words, I don't actually fit the stereotypical profile of what a jazz musician or a jazz composer might look like. That research took a sociocultural approach, analyzing the different musical 
communities in which I have practiced my, my art and my feelings of being part of that community or not being part of that community. And it also contained a portfolio of compositions that reflected the different stages of my development as a musician that took place within those communities. Today, however, as I mentioned, I'm going to actually address the music behind my music rather than the extra musical, socio-cultural kinds of um, factors. So the three very broad genres, uh, which I'm going to talk briefly about today, um, broad genres and also musical cultures, which were under examination in my thesis, but also which are the predominant influences on my musical identity are these three, Western art music, jazz and Latin jazz, which is a catch-all term for just about every kind of music from Central and South America. So I've put all these terms in quotation marks because each of them is so broad and encompasses so much different music. And indeed, the boundaries between all these different genres are blurring to the extent that some could mount a credible argument that the terms are almost meaningless. But in my musical life, they haven't been meaningless because as I was involved in all these different musical worlds, I acquired a different, uh, different sets of skills, um, different knowledge, and which has all contributed to my evolution as um, an improviser and as a composer. So before talking about specific things that I learned from playing and studying music in these three worlds, I would like to address what is really the central issue for me and the single aspect of musicianship which has facilitated my evolution as an improviser and composer. And many of you in the room will not be surprised that that is the development of the ear. So I can see that many of you in the hall today either are currently or have been in my oral studies classes in the jazz area and will realize the importance that I place on this particular aspect of musicianship. Although I have had a musical ear since childhood, um, the penny really dropped for me when I was doing my master's level studies at the New England Conservatory in Boston, where I was lucky enough to study with such eminent artist composers as Rand Blake, Paul Blay, and the microtonal jazz pioneer, Joe Maneri. For these musicians, everything revolved around the ear. Theoretical, analytical, historical, sociocultural knowledge, this is all really important, but for them, they felt that a musician could never reach his or her full potential without a fully functioning musical ear. Rand Blake is, of course, the architect of the third stream oral training method that underpins the curriculum in my oral studies classes. And in an early article entitled The Primacy of the Ear, he says this. The ear itself should be the main conduit for learning music, not just learning music, but exercising one's long-term memory while establishing a broad repertoire and assimilating styles in detail. But the development of memory and other learning skills are not the only benefits from such an approach. The deeper emotional and spiritual aspects of music can be absorbed by the soul of the musician if we can validate music's chief sensory organ, the ear. So a number of important ideas for me are in this quote. The first is long-term memory. And you will shortly hear that the most important, what I feel is the most important element in the foundation of my compositional practice depends on my long-term musical memory. Blake also refers to establishing a broad repertoire and assimilating details of style. Close listening and also practical knowledge through playing has given me a knowledge of music across many different styles and genres, which I am now able to use um, in my, in my composition and my improvisation. He also suggests that deeper emotional and spiritual aspects of music can be absorbed by the soul of the musician through listening and study. If these aspects of music are recognized and appreciated by the musician, there is a possibility or even a likelihood that such a musician will want to communicate on a deeper emotional or spiritual level with his or her listeners. Listeners may well appreciate a coherent musical structure or clever modulations or mathematically complex rhythms. These are all features of music that are principally understood via the brain, but listeners are moved by what touches them emotionally, and that is what they're able to perceive and understand with their ears. 
Another concept which is absolutely critical to my way of working as a composer and improviser is audiation. So audiation is a term that was coined by American music educator and, uh, re and researcher Edwin Gordon, and he describes it this way. Audiation is the foundation of musicianship. It takes place when we hear and comprehend music for which the sound is no longer or may never have been present. One may audiate when listening to music, performing from notation, playing by ear, improvising, composing, or notating music. So probably everybody in the room will have experienced this phenomenon. Some musicians seem to be born with this skill and here I'm thinking of Mozart, for example, writing his first symphony at age eight, which has to be evidence of an absolutely exceptional ability to audiate or to hear music in his head. Another example from the classical canon is Beethoven, who continued to compose even when he had been stricken with really profound deafness. But for the rest of us mortals, this is a skill that can be um, developed through practice and study. I was very lucky as a child because I had a piano teacher who was really a true musician. And in preparation for performances, she encouraged me to sit with the score away from the piano and to just hear the music in my mind as I was reading the score. And only much later was I able to understand that she was actually showing me a way to develop my ability to audiate. So there are eight types of audiation that uh, Gordon has identified. As you can see, listening and reading to familiar or unfamiliar music, writing, as in dictation from a musical source, recalling and performing from memory, recalling and writing from memory, uh, creating and improvising unfamiliar music um, out just on its own or while you're reading um, a score, a lead sheet, for example, and also creating and improvising um, your own music and writing it out. So types six and eight describe processes that I use um, it, it, as part of my compositional practice, of course. Um, and type seven might describe the creation of an improvised accompaniment, for example, when you're working from a jazz lead sheet, which is just melody and chord symbols, and you're audiating and creating the accompaniment as you go. Um, Gordon further breaks down audiation into stages of, I would say, stages of skill acquisition, momentary retention, initiating and audiating tonal patterns and rhythm patterns, and identifying a tonal center and a, a rhythmic framework in your head, establishing tonality and meter, consciously retaining in audiation tonal patterns and rhythm patterns that we have organized, that we create ourselves, consciously recall, recalling patterns organized and audiated in other pieces of music, and also conscious prediction of patterns. Oh, sorry. Um, there are, I would suggest that there are potentially further stages of audiation, in fact I know there are, such as initiating and audiating chords or chord progressions which are not tonally identified, or melodies with shifting tonal centers or perhaps with no clear tonal center, in other words, music which is not actually dependent on the diatonic patterns which are familiar to all of us. Nonetheless, these descriptions of the types and stages of skill of audiation have helped me to understand and articulate my own experiences. And certainly there's not a day that goes by in my life, I think, when I um, haven't actually experienced the phenomenon of hearing music in my head. So this is obviously a very useful set of skills for composing music as well. If you happen to have a piece of paper with you and a pencil, you can write down an idea that comes to you wherever you happen to be. Or if you don't, and perhaps you have attained stage four in your acquisition of audiation skills, you can retain the tonal and rhythmic patterns that you've created until you get home and you can write them down or sing them into a recording device or put them into Sibelius or however you prefer to work. So we'll come back to this later, to the whole question of audiation. But now I'd like to return, oh, here's a slide of my little scraps and bits of um, music that I've created on the run <laughs> in my diary or in any kind of a piece of paper I happen to have with me. Um, so now I'd like to just continue to talk a little bit about um, classical music, jazz, and uh, 
um, Central and South American music and what I specifically learned from, the, from studying these music. So the first is Western art music. My exposure to Western art music was through private lessons on piano and clarinet and also going to symphony concerts, chamber music concerts, also listening to mostly my father's uh, records. His tastes tended to run to the Russian Romantic School, but uh, not exclusively, but I heard lots of um, very exquisite melodies such as this one when I was growing up. This wonderful French horn solo. to cut that off, <laughs> but it's melodies such as that which um, really were um, significant uh, in, my, um, in my learning as a young musician. Here's another one that uh, was one of my father's real favorites. This is just the theme from Tchaikovsky's Variations.
Okay, so that's, um, <clears throat> that's the transition into the first variation on the Rococo theme. Um, so you may be surprised to hear from someone who's ostensibly a jazz composer so much um, reference to classical music, and there will be more as we come along, but it was really a very important part of my early training. So not only Tchaikovsky, but also Rachmaninoff and Prokofiev, Brahms, Chopin, Schumann, Beethoven, Bach's unaccompanied cello suites, Rodrigo's Concerto de Aranjuez, and many other great works of Western classical music. This early exposure to great melodies has left me with a lingering but perhaps hopelessly old-fashioned conviction that melody is the most important feature of a composition, and at least I regard it as the most important feature of my compositions, and one criterion that everything I, I write must meet is that the melody must stand alone, which is to say the melody must say something and mean something on its own without harmonic and rhythmic support. And I'm sure you'd agree that those two absolutely timeless melodies would uh, fit those criteria. So this is the greatest lesson that I think I learned from the classical tradition, and one which has underpinned everything I've written in every genre ever since. Um, and this is also a lesson that depends on my long-term melody, since these are melodies that I was listening to as a child, which at this point was more than 40 years ago, and they're still stashed away in my oral library. So the next very important feature of music, of course, is harmony, and this is where my training in jazz really comes to the fore. I found lots of wonderful melodies in, um, in jazz, of course, and it was at that point that I probably came to realize that that theme from the Rococo Variations is an A-A-B-A -A -A song form, and it contains two five one chord progressions and secondary dominance. <laughs> So, um, and that's part of the point. This was the real discovery for me, which is unlocking the world of diatonic harmony. And it's not that you can't find every sort of sonority, tonality, modality, chord progression, harmonic texture in classical music, but jazz training made me start to hear harmony in a different way because you are required to improvise over top of the, of the harmonic scheme and also because we did quite a lot of rigorous ear training as part of the program. Chords and chord progressions are also a topic of, topic of endless fascination for jazz pianists, since a large part of our job is creating interesting pathways through harmonic structures in order to accompany instrumentalists and vocalists. So a necessary part of my training and part of the discovery of harmony was spending many, many hours at the piano playing through chord progressions and exploring different ways to voice chords. So I'll come back to harmony in a moment, but in relation to the idea of, in relation to the idea of audiation that I mentioned earlier, but just before we do that, we'll go on to the third uh, very important aspect of music, and that is, of course, rhythm. So there are many ways to develop rhythmic awareness, and of course, it's impossible to play jazz effectively without developing an understanding of the various grooves and time fields that are associated with the genre. However, my rhythmic awakening um, was probably when I started playing with various Colombian, Cuban, Dominic Dominican, and Haitian bands in Montreal after I'd completed my undergraduate studies in jazz. In all these musics, the piano functions as a true part of the rhythm section, playing repeated patterns which interlock with the percussion instruments and the bass. I was introduced to rhythm concepts such as Afro-Cuban and Brazilian claves, and also to whole new genres of music that I had not been aware of, such as son, huahuanco, merengue, compa, rara, cumbia, pambiche, bachata, and many more. I also began to really understand the function of the piano as truly threefold, melodic, harmonic, and also rhythmic. So that brings us probably to my once I had a set of those skills together, um, I was ready to embark on my journey as a composer, I guess. So the first step in my evolution as a composer was taking a composition class at Concordia University in Montreal in the early 1990s. It is not an exaggeration to say that this class changed my life. We were required to write 40 compositions in a 16-week semester which is an average of 2.5 a week pretty well. 
I started the class wondering if I'd actually have any ideas at all. And by the time I'd finished, I actually had a portfolio of compositions across a range of jazz styles. They weren't all great compositions. Many of them haven't actually uh, had, a, had a public performance and never will. Um, but some of them are actually still in my repertoire with my various uh, incarnations of the Louise Denson group. This class was designed to train us um, in a practical approach to composing by giving us set tasks. The tasks were right in the class were, of course, writing a song in a certain musical style or perhaps in the style of a certain composer or demonstrating the use of uh, compositional techniques, a certain kind of harmony or a certain way to develop the melody or whatever. So this is an approach that I use to this day, especially if I'd not had a chance to compose for a while, and that is setting myself a clear goal. So I'll sit down with a project to write a bossa nova or a ballad or an art song or start a work for a particular ensemble or for a particular artist. So that gives me a motivation to actually sit down at the piano and start thinking about composing. You can See, here at the start of um, winter and summer holidays, inevitably I have a list in my diary of tasks that I'm hoping to complete in the following weeks. And you can see here um, tasks that are both practical and artistic. For example, on there we have, I think, edit some charts. I think that's on, yes, editing charts, but also sending charts to the Australian Music Center so that they can publish them on their site but also uh, over on this right-hand side, strings, color of love, bolero, as in write a bolero, and crossed out is song for Margaret. It seems to be on there twice, I don't know why, but that refers to a song cycle that I wrote a couple of years ago for Margaret Schindler to sing in a concert here. So they're um, practical and they're also um, actual composition tasks that I'm gonna set myself. You can see not all of them seem to have gotten done at the time, but uh, that's all right. They can go on the next list. So um, from the outset, I developed uh, a couple of different ways of working. The first of which I'm sure you're not surprised to hear is actually sitting and improvising at the piano. So all my training as a pianist, my kinesthetic knowledge of the keyboard, my muscle memory, my knowledge of diatonic harmony and rhythm and so on and various musical styles, all combine with various types of audiation in, to point me in different musical directions. The second is more mysterious to me and involves audiation away from the keyboard. During my jazz studies, I had worked to, develop, to further develop this skill, but rather than reading from a score and hearing music, um, rather than reading from a score and hearing music in my head, the task became hearing, for example, how the bass and drums might be creating a groove, um, hearing a melody, hearing a harmonic progression in the form of a song, hearing improvised variations on a melody. So still audiating, but aiming for different kinds of musical goals at that point. When I think about my earliest attempts to write music as a child and as a teenager, I think I have always heard melody and harmony together in my head. But as a result of studying jazz, the harmonic variety and complexity that I am now able to audiate is much greater. So as a friend of mine used to say, um, oh, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, every note has a harmonic solution, which is to say that there's an appropriate chord to support that note, depending on the role that that note has in that composition at that particular moment. And conversely, the harmony behind a note can determine what role that note has in the song. So I'd like to actually move to the piano now and do a little bit of a demonstration of how this might play out. Because this is a bit of a difficult thing to demonstrate because you can't hear what I'm hearing in my head. <laughs> so I'm going to try to hear uh, or hear and sing for you different harmonizations of a note which might point me in one direction or another if I'm starting to write a song. So, I have to pick a note and a range that I can sing. <clears throat> 
Um, so I could hear this as the fifth of a major triad, for example. So. So that's likely to be a one chord, a major one chord. That's probably the key of the piece that I'm going to be writing. But what if I hear this? Um, do, 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 do. So now that's a dominant quality chord. So this is probably not my one chord. It's probably going somewhere else. Do, So now I've got a five chord going to a one chord. But what if it goes here? Do, 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 do. So maybe that now wants to go. So now I have a progression which is going to go um, okay so i'm hearing a moving a melody moving up and i'm also hearing those chords at the same time right so given that this note can function in relation to all the other 11 pitches in the um, octave and various combinations of those, um, the harmony that I'm hearing is going to point me in a certain direction in terms of the composition, right? So what if I hear this? Um, do, do, do. Suddenly I'm in a minor key. This might be a one chord or it might be going somewhere, it might um, be a two chord. Maybe this is do, 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 and it's gonna go to do, do, do. So this might be my one chord. This is just getting me to my one chord, right? So that's part of what's, that's a lot of what's going on in my head when, I, when I'm writing music is I'm trying to hear a chord and I'm trying to hear where that chord wants to go. If that's not too um, metaphysical a way to talk about it. <laughs> but we all know that certain notes and certain sounds have a tendency, like this one. Doesn't sound like it's at rest. It wants to go somewhere, right? Maybe it, maybe it just wants to go here or there, you know, but it doesn't want to stay where it is. It wants to move. So um, that, as I say, is how I, how I use my ear and how I use my capacity at this point to audiate, to guide me in the process of composition. So it tends to be um, an intuitive kind of a process. Um, when, you're, when I'm stuck and I can't really hear where the music wants to go, then I have all my knowledge of harmony, of chord shapes, of potential melodic directions and things where I can go, all right, I really don't know where I want to go next. What if I do this? <laughs> Maybe not the best choice, but I can try something and see if it is, is going to work. But I think when I play, um, I'll shortly play a little example for you where you can hear me pausing and trying to hear where I want to go next with, um, with a melody. Um, so here, now I'd like to actually play a couple of compositions for you or excerpts from compositions that demonstrate these two different approaches to working. One is working at the piano and one is working away from the piano. Um, they're both from a, again, classical music, a song cycle that I wrote for Sarah Court, who's a soprano singer from New Zealand, and um, Therese Milanovic to perform at a concert here. So you can see perhaps on this one, this is the poem from, uh, by Hilda Doolittle, um, the cycle of poems that the song cycle was based on. And 
You can see scribbled all around the edge of this is the actual melody for the second poem in the cycle called Could Eros Be Kept? And I wrote this while we were traveling to Tenterfield, New South Wales to visit my um, sister-in-law. Um, I wasn't driving, I was in the passenger seat. And um, I'd been reciting the poem and hearing the rhythms of the poem and thinking about the mood of the lyrics and what kind of a melody might suit it. So there it is, down on, all scribbled around. And here is, um, and here is the song. <laughs> So that poem, this cycle is about uh, the author, the poet's um, anguish um, at the end of a, a, a love affair. And that one is, uh, can Eros be kept? It, she's saying, can the thrill of romantic love last? And um, as you can see here, um, I didn't really, I didn't have any idea of what the accompaniment necessarily would be at the time or the pacing of the phrases within the form, but the shapes of the phrases were dictated by the words, of course, and that, li that Lydian melody with the sharp four at the top communicates the hope that that kind of thrill of first love would last, whereas the, the accompaniment is rather more foreboding and suggests that perhaps it won't. So this one is the fourth song out of the five, and these excerpts are me noodling at the piano. So that first one's an example of me audiating a melody in my head uh, in the car, and here's me noodling away at the piano, um, working out the accompaniment figure for the beginning of this song.
writing things down as well. get the idea. Um, so I'm, and those, I have, you know, um, recorded um, e excerpts from my little Zoom that last 15, 20, 25 minutes of me kind of working on different sounds and working on different transitions. And sometimes you can hear me, um, you know, croaking out the melody over top of the accompaniment and trying to make the melody notes match with the chords and things. So as they say, that's not surprising. I'm sure every composer with piano chops, which is pretty well every composer in the world, um, does that kind of thing. So um, here, I'll let you hear the song as well because um, hear what it turned out like.
So songs two and two and four out of um, that song cycle, which is called Fragment Forty, and that song, the poet's describing the intensity of her anguish, and at the end, the day breaks, she survived. <laughs> Okay, so we just have a few minutes left. Just to finish up, um, I'd like to just play a piece for you, which is a fairly recent composition um, called Now You Are Gone. It was in one of the slides, and it's a bolero. So it sort of brings together all the things that I've talked about today, I hope, which is to say that it's got um, a melody which I think stands alone, I like to think that it does, and which is a really key feature of the composition. It's got um, some interesting, perhaps unexpected harmonic motion um, and harmonic uh, sonor sonorities, which are very characteristic of jazz and of contemporary jazz vocabulary. Um, a bolero is also a Cuban musical style. It's also a Cuban dance, a very slow, romantic, elegant kind of a dance. Um, and I'd also just like to add that I've written quite a number of boleros at this point, and every one of them is in a way an homage to a great star of Cuban music, Chucho Valdez, who's an absolutely splendid um, pianist, improviser, composer, and also um, band leader, and just um, generally um, uh, great force in Cuban music. Um, years ago, I heard a composition of his called Claudia, um, and which is an absolutely beautiful bolero and which is stored in my oral memory and has sort of become the prototype for uh, every bolero that I've written since, even though I don't think many of my boleros actually sound very much like Claudia. But this is a bit of an homage. So I'll just uh, play that.